Okay, here is part six of my eight part breakdown of how they got away with fixing the 2021 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Now, there's probably more steps to steps this. In fact, there's certain to be more steps than this. But the way I've tried to simply break it down is with these eight steps. Firstly, the F1 TV narrative, the Sky Sports F1 narrative, uh, the Michael Massey error, the post-race appeal, um, the media conditioning. This one is about the FIA in action in that week after the race, up until the Thursday, where Mercedes cut a deal with them. And then part seven and eight are to come. Just to recap, for those of you that haven't seen the first five videos, in order for you to believe that event as having any sort of authenticity whatsoever, um, you had to believe that what you were seeing was real. You had to have your attention uh, directed in a certain direction. So from the moment Nicholas Latifi crashed, the pictures broadcast to you had to inform you what was going on. And what the focus of those pictures was, was what's happening in this situation. Oh, Lewis Hamilton hasn't pitted. Oh, Max Verstappen has pitted. He's now on fresh soft tyres. Oh, we've cut into the Mercedes garage. There's the Mercedes garage looking frustrated. There's Lewis Hamilton's tyres still in their tyre blankets, unable to be fitted. If they get racing again, we're going to be in a situation where Lewis Hamilton is going to be defenceless because of these old tyres. Oh, it's all potentially going wrong. Oh, now we're going to restart. So it's already conditioned you to that notion. And the reality is, all that truly mattered is we've now witnessed this crash. This takes time to deal with. Is there enough time to go racing? What re is required to happen before we go racing? They never told you that. Instead, they lied. OK, what is going on at the clear up of the crash? How long is it taking? Let's have a look. Let's see what's happening, because then we can assess the likelihood of whether we will see a resumption to racing. OK, this is what happens when there's an incident that creates a safety issue and the safety car is deployed. The race is neutralised. All that has gone on before, them gaps get all uh, collected up. Any of the lapped cars get released because some of them will have been held back and will have lost ground on the competitors they were previously able to challenge. So that situation needs to be sorted out. Then lapped cars released, allowed to catch the back of the pack so that all of them gaps have been nullified. And then we've met the restart condition. We can go racing again. If it's not possible to do that, that race ends behind the safety car. The point in time that that incident occurs became the point where the race stopped. It's that, uh, essentially, that's it. It's quite simple. But instead, they hyped up the show. But they did that with what they showed you and the radio messages they interjected with. Number two was the Sky Sports narrative. From the very moment it happened, Brundle and Crofty began hyping everybody up. There's bound to be a couple of laps racing remaining. There's bound to be a couple. Are we going to see any more racing laps? We think we should do, could do. Oh, they don't have to let the lapped cars through. That's not mandatory in, a, in the regulations, but that's normally on a wet day. All lies, all bullshit. The average number of laps lost out of a race when such an incident takes place and cars have been lapped is five and a half laps. There were only 5.4 laps left in that event when that crash took place. So it's the likelihood is if you take the average, we're not going to see any more racing. That race is going to end behind the safety car. Brundle and Crofty. Oh, no, 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 no. They direct your attention to. Oh, look at the excitement here. You're going to see this shootout and it's going to be one lap to determine the outcome of the world championship. Right. That's a false narrative that they convince you of. All of this took place. The pictures you were shown, the messages interjected between the teams and the drivers, 
All of this happened before this so-called error under pressure. Brundle and Crofty lying before this error under pressure. You're telling me that that was just, these are independent events that all built to the same thing, but it's all, all coincidence. It's just a coincidence that F1 TV were diverting your attention that way. It's just a coincidence that Brundle and Crofty were lying about the rules before the rules were broken. Oh, but they don't have to release the lap cars. Oh, but the purpose of releasing the lap cars is to get them out of the way. And once they've released them, how long will they wait? Oh, the safety car's ending. Oh, we're going to have this lap. No, no, that's possible. It's not for them reasons. Why are they saying that? Oh, the race director's made an error. Yeah, but why were you saying those things beforehand? Suggesting those things were going to happen before they happened. <laughs> They're all linked. They're all linked. So, this so-called human error, part three, it's all blamed on one guy being under pressure. Oh, we, we, we heard that radio message that F1 TV chose to play us on lap 57 of that race, when Horner's going, uh, we only need one racing lap, and the lap cars haven't been let through. So even if they are let through, the safety car has to stay on track for a further lap, so there's still no racing. But F1 TV still chose to play us that message. Okay, so that's not authentic. Oh, it's because Massey was under pressure from Red Bull, and that's why he panicked and made that decision. There's 10 people from FIA, at least 10 people, FIA employees in race control. It's not just one guy, not just one guy under pressure, there's at least 10. They know the rules of the sport, they know the regulations, they know the implications of those regulations. That procedure has been carried out hundreds of times over the course of the sport's history, okay? But in terms of how many times Massey, I've done videos on it, I've evidenced the number of times Massey has done this, the four times he actually kept that safety car on track for two laps beyond the lap that those lapped cars were released upon. Making sure those released cars made it all the way back to the end of the safety car snake. That demonstrates he knows the implications of those regulations. And what did he do? He neglected all of that and did it to set up a two-car race-off, knowing that you cannot do that. And that is what he did. So, that is not an error. That is, that is a known breaking of the rules with known consequences. It's not an error. So don't try and tell me, oh yeah, I was just, I panicked, I was under pressure. No, you know what it's for, and you purposely neglected that, to afford the opportunity for just one competitor from one team to achieve an outcome that you knew was going to happen. That is not an error made in good faith. That is you manipulating the outcome of a sporting event. That's fixing an event. Number four, Mercedes, as you're allowed to do in the sport of Formula One, then appealed to the governing body, the FIA, that the FIA had broken their own rules. They were entirely correct. The FIA had broken their own rules. By breaking their own rules, it changed the outcome of the event and therefore Mercedes requested to reinstate back to the point where the rules weren't broken and declare that as the race result, which they're entitled to do and which the FIA are entitled to do. What did the FIA do? They invited Red Bull into that appeal process, which they shouldn't have done, and requested that Red Bull put forward a different argument, which the FIA then sided with. Oh, yes, we agree with Red Bull on their interpretation of what they think that these regulations actually mean, even though Red Bull had competed under those regulations for a 198 Grand Prix and accepted the purpose of those, those regulations being what they were. But on the 199th Grand Prix since 2012, when these regulations had been reintroduced, Red Bull all of a sudden, oh no, that's not what they mean. This word here can be interpreted a different way. This can mean something else. This, 
this is the argument that was allowed to be put forward by these FIA stewards. None of those arguments, when you follow them through and look at the implications of what those arguments produce, none of them have any validity whatsoever. And yet the FIA went, oh, yes, we agree with Red Bull on this one. Massey lies in that appeal. Massey says the purpose of these regulations is to ensure get these lap cars out of the way. That's not the purpose, Massey. The four times that you kept that safety car on track for an additional lap. Well, them cars were out of the way by then. And you kept the safety car on track. So what was your purpose then, Massey? So don't lie. Because them lies can be unpicked. The truth just is the truth. And you're lying. Number five was the media conditioning. Immediately, from the moment, well, even before it happened, obviously, was the number two, the Sky Sports narrative, building you to believe different possibilities. But immediately after it happened, and then continually afterwards, the media has conditioned the viewer, the fan, of some sort of validity to what took place. Oh, it was just a bit controversial. Oh, it all happened so quickly. Oh, the guy was under pressure. But never mind. Don't you worry your little heads about this. Yes, you can, you can all have your own opinions on this. But after all, Max there, he fully deserved it. He led the most amount of laps all season. Utter irrelevant bollocks. Utter irrelevant bollocks bollocks try and divert oh yes we should applaud max for being the greatest you've ever seen he led the most laps he got a record number of podiums he won the most races he did this he did that he did the it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because some of them statistics are lies anyway okay because race wins when you dis dismiss the belgian parade which wasn't a race no competition took place there so to declare somebody the of the winner of something that wasn't an even a, even a contest is ridiculous okay so that's got to be stripped from the history of of time but abu dhabi is less listed as a max verstappen win when if the rules were applied it's a lewis hamilton win so you strip out you, going into that race, we were told Max has won nine races, Lewis has won eight. Well, straight away you strip out Belgium because that wasn't a race. That's eight all. Lewis Hamilton's the winner of Abu Dhabi, so that puts it nine eight to Lewis. They try and tell you Max won ten races to Lewis's eight. Well, that's a false statistic. That's a false statistic. But ultimately, it doesn't matter how many races you've won. OK, so don't try and project somebody as being great based on those statistics. The only thing that matters is the criteria that it takes to win the world championship. And that is who accumulated the most amount of points over the course of that season. And had you not broken the rules, even with that Belgian parade gift, it was still Lewis Hamilton. And the Belgian parade, Max was handed five more points than Lewis was. So even if you include that, which should be wiped from history, Lewis Hamilton validly, without the Abu Dhabi fix, accumulated the most amount of championship points that season. He did so, having had to deal with being ran off the track in Brazil, had to deal with being ran off the track in Saudi Arabia, had to deal with being brake tested in Saudi Arabia, had to deal with Max Verstappen not being penalised adequately for numerous offences throughout the course of the season. They don't tell you that. They're not interested in telling you that. They just want to tell you, oh, Max Verstappen, he fully deserved it. They made programme after programme after programme. They put in front of you talking head after talking head after talking head. Brundle, Crofty, all these former F1 drivers, Rosberg, Hill, Button, Herbert, all telling you 
right? All telling you the validation. Oh, yeah, it's all right, everybody. Yeah, we can, get, we can acknowledge the fact that some people will feel aggrieved by this. But ultimately, you know, when all said and done, we need to accept that Max Verstappen was the deserving champion of 2021. That's the narrative they want to convince you of and divert your attention from what is true, from what is real. Because it was a contrivance. They're being paid to get condition you to not challenge the corruption that has taken place. So in order for corruption to take place, you have to convince people that it's not corrupt. You have to have the enforcement agencies turn a blind eye to it and not enforce the laws, the rules. And you have to get people to move on so that there's no consequence to you. And then that way you get to keep all of the, the benefit that you've made from that corrupt act. All of that benefit gain is the increased wealth, the increased exposure of the sport, causing increased social media engagement, which causes increased social media traffic, which means the advertising space is worth a lot more in F1 social media. The interest in the sport has been ramped up because there's people that previously were like, oh, what, what's Formula One? And now because of the kind of um, the, the, the kind of buzzer about the sport be created by that incident, there's more people with eyes on the sport. The more people with eyes on the sport, the greater the advertising kind of value of that space is. It makes more money. Each of the teams is worth more money now. The TV revenue is worth more. The advertising revenue linked with all of this is worth more. So therefore, the teams can command greater amount of, of uh, payments to, for, to, for, for sponsors advertising on their cars. Liberty Media is worth more money because the show, the whole thing is worth more now because it can generate more money. They've all gained. They've all gained. We have a governing body, the FIA. They are in charge of applying the rules of the sport, making sure that that sport is contested in accordance with the rules. They're in charge of enforcing those rules, making sure that what goes on is right. So what did the governing body actually do? Well, when administering the event itself, they broke their own rules initially. That was the third step of this eight step process. In the post race appeal, when their representatives were dealing with an appeal by one of the competitors, they broke their rules again. After the event, when all of the panic had dissipated when all of the heat had dissipated and you can look at that event with calmness what did they do nothing when you oversee something which isn't right which is unprecedented has never happened before and you are the people responsible for that, which the FIA are, it is your job, it is your responsibility to deal with it. It's your responsibility, if necessary, to set a precedent. What did the FIA do? Nothing. They effectively said, the only way this can be dealt with is if Mercedes appeal. Mercedes will have to lodge an appeal by the Thursday of this week and if they do we then have to go into this process. This is all on Mercedes and then they did some underhand deal with Mercedes so that Mercedes didn't lodge that appeal. The FIA could easily have said we need to do something about this. Forget this notion of Mercedes appealing. 
What has happened is clearly wrong. We can explain what is wrong, what went wrong, what it produced and how that is completely wrong and what we need to do about it. Quite easy to do. It's quite easy to explain to people in the way that I've explained to you. This is the safety car situation. This is what happens when an incident occurs which does this to races. It nullifies racing when a car crashes and causes a safety issue on the track. So when we deploy the safety car, it nullifies racing. The only way we can go racing again is to achieve this valid restart condition. It wasn't possible to achieve that in time. Therefore, the race should not have restarted. It should have ended behind the safety car. So unfortunately, despite you all getting excited for seeing what you saw on that last lap, that was invalid. That cannot be, that, that's got to be scrubbed. Okay. And actually, the race result is the running order at the end of lap 56. That's what it is. End of story. There's your explanation. The race director got it totally wrong. The stewards got it totally wrong. This is the right course of action. The commentators got it totally wrong. F1 TV got it totally wrong. So therefore, they've conditioned you of a false narrative. OK, they didn't have to disclose that. They didn't have to disclose that they were all in on it. OK, but they could have explained to the world. This is the problem. What you saw should never have happened. It's not right that it did happen. And therefore, this is what needs to happen. And if you don't like it, unlucky. We've explained the rules. It's been clear that we've defined what is the problem here. And this is the solution. What did they do? Instead, they were, oh, yeah, there's nothing we can do. You're the governing body. Of course, there is something you can do. You even got Brundle the day after the event going, oh, there's no mechanism to do anything about this. There's no mechanism to do anything about this, which is utter lies. Now, if you go onto Twitter, there is a um, chap on Twitter and the Twitter handle is uh, at F1WDC2021. And he's doing some great work in delving into the FIA regulations for how they will deal or how they should deal with this process. And despite Brundle telling you or being put up to tell you, oh, there's no mechanism for the FIA to deal with this or to reverse the, the, the situation or the decision. Well, there is, but they're claiming there isn't. So why would you do that? If there's a mechanism to change something that there's already exists and you're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't do anything about that. That's a choice. You're choosing not to do anything about that. Well, why would you do that? It's because you want it to be the way it is rather than the way it is. It should be because that's the right thing. So there's corruption, isn't there? That is corruption. But let's be clear about it, it is corruption. And this is just one of the things, because the, there's, there's numerous different regulations whereby they could have easily just gone, right, this is the process. This is in the regulations. This is what we must do. He's done this countless times. And there's lots of different things which you could just pick any one of them and go, well, this is a valid reason why we need to do this. This is another valid reason why we need to do this. He's done loads. But just this one. Dear Toto Wolf. If you really believe it is so unfair what happened to Lewis at Abu Dhabi 2021, why aren't you demanding that Ben Sulayem exercise his power to refer the matter to the ICA under Judicial and Disciplinary Article 9.1.1D? He can refer it until the March of 2027, as there is a five-year statute of limitation on suspected regulation infringements. They came up with this bullshit of going, oh, yeah, but you can't change it now because Max has been handed the uh, the world championship title. So once that's been handed to Max, you can't change it. Is, is this is this what happens in sport? Oh, you've given the gold medal to Ben Johnson at the uh, 
1988 Olympics. You can't change that now. No, he's a drugs cheat. Oh, you've given those uh, five world champion, uh, sorry, five yellow jersey Tour de France winning trophies to Lance Armstrong. You can't take it off him now. You can't change the result. No, no, he's a drugs cheat. Cheating has gone on. Rules have been broken. You strip the beneficiaries of those rule breaks of their accomplishment, which isn't valid. And if if you can find a valid winner, which they couldn't do in those Tour de France years because they had suspicions that over 70% of those competitors were also on drugs. So that's why you don't see winners of those Tour de France years. But at the 1988 Olympics, you award it to the competitor that you can identify as having not failed the drug test. So you get the rightful winner of the event. Quite easy. Quite easy. We do not accept it being swept under the carpet and being legitimised without confirmation of whether it's allowed within the regulations to bring the safety car in on the same lap as unlapping lapped cars. According to the ICA ruling in January 2024, the overriding authority does not negate the need for regulations to be fully applied. This ruling in January 2024 is this one about a different motor racing series where further shenanigans were going going on and they had uh, a appeal to the ICA and they, they obliterated this notion of the race director having overriding authority on the use of the safety car to operate it in the, in the way that Massey did. The way that that has been reported to you by the likes of Autosport is completely false because Autosport headlined that to the notion that, oh, this is proof that Mercedes would have lost their appeal, which is completely wrong. It's actually proof that Mercedes would have won. That's what it's actually proof of. But what's your agenda, Autosport? Your billionaire owner in the Billionaires Boys Club needs you to convince people to move on. Oh, yeah, Mercedes would have lost. No, Nobody can do anything about this. Don't challenge this. Don't challenge this. You can't do anything about it. They'd have lost anyway. It's fine. Move on. You're being told lies. You're being told lies by the media. The governing body was manipulated. The so-called government of the sport, those there that are tasked with setting and enforcing the rules, are being manipulated to not do that. That had to happen in order for this to have happened. That what has to happen for corruption to stand. Because if these regulatory bodies do their job, it's, it, it can't happen. If the FIA did its job, if it wasn't a corrupt organisation, which it clearly is, the FIA are entirely corrupt. If it wasn't a corrupt organisation, this couldn't have happened. They're entirely corrupt. They had a race director and 10 people in race control that were corrupt. They had four stewards that were entirely corrupt. They've then not done anything about it in these days between the Sunday and the Thursday where they should have looked at the situation and came out to the world and said, look, what happened on Sunday was wrong. We are the governing body. This is what should have happened. These are the rules of the sport. These are why the rules are what they are. And what you saw should never have happened. What you saw changed the outcome of the World Championship. We cannot allow that because it invalidates the sport. This is a sport. You need to understand this. This is what, what went wrong. This is how it changed the outcome. This is why it needed to have been this way. And this is what we're going to do about it. These are the changes to that that we're going to make. Which we're allowed to do because we are the governing body and we set the precedent. That's what it's about. 
instead. Oh, yeah. Mercedes, they can choose to appeal or not. Otherwise, unlucky. It's just going to stand. There's nothing we can do. It's just all a bit confusing, isn't it? But don't you worry. We'll do a thorough review of the situation to make sure it never happens again. That's what they want to tell you. That's what they want to tell you. Now, what I was able to articulate, because if you remember, during the, between during that time between the Sunday and the Thursday, social media went crazy. The mainstream media was writing articles after articles after articles, and we were bringing into the notion, uh, oh, 48.12 and 48.13, overriding 48.12, and 15.3, and the race directors overriding authority. All this, trying to confuse people, getting people to argue, getting people to argue over Mercedes pit strategy, whether Max fully deserved it, um, all of these different variables that just created conflict, caused diversion. And I was looking at all of this and going, nobody's hitting the nail on the head here. Even without getting into the technical detail of the wording of regulations and trying to analyse that. There's one simple fact here. What you did separated out just two cars in a multi-competitor event separated them out, put them out at the front of everybody and let them race off for the win of a race. You are not allowed to do that. You can't just pick out two of them and go, right, you two, go. Oh, the rest of you, you're held back for a bit. Oh, you can now go. That's what you did. By what you did, by not applying the regulations, which you have to do, that is what you produced. That's not allowed. That negates sporting fairness. The third place competitor in that in that race could not challenge for a top two position. They were only able to, to begin that final lap two and a half seconds behind third place. You're not going to make that up in just one lap. Two and a half seconds behind with two lapped cars in between. What have you done? You've skewed the outcome. You've fixed that outcome of that event so that only one of two can win it. And you also know that one is 99% certain to overcome the other one because of the tyres that they're on. That's fixing a race. So even without analysing what the regulations may state, that very fact alone is enough to say that is entirely wrong. You've clearly done something wrong there. And yet nobody was able to articulate that. I wrote to Sky Sports. I wrote to the FIA. I explained that to them in simple terms. You've still never heard it. You've still never heard that simple fact. Why? Why? It's because they are all in on it. They all produced it. They contrived to produce it. And now they contrive to cover it up to, so that the truth of the situation is not exposed to the world. This is the media that hide that truth because they're paid to present the agenda and they're all making money out of it. The teams are making money. The FIA get their income as a percentage of what the sport itself generates. So they're making more money out of this. There's your corruption. It's all money orientated. They don't care about sporting integrity. They don't care about integrity. They don't care about ethics. They're breaking the law. And they're getting away with it. That's the truth of the situation. And on from that. They then. Had to continue that campaign. With the use of their media. To condition the fans to try to accept it. And to move on from it. They kept it bubbling though. They kept it bubbling. They wanted social media to keep bubbling. They wanted that conflict in social media. Because the more it kept bubbling. The more the conflict. The more money they made. 
the more money they made because in that off season when Formula One social media traffic normally goes quiet, that was a bubbling space where there was it. F1 is trending. F1 is trending. When something's trending, it makes more money because the advertising revenue linked with that social media activity generates more money. They kept that media machine feeding the conflict. They did it on purpose. One month on from the event, they got Sky Sports F1 to make a programme about the event, further lying about it. You tell me where a sport needs to make a special programme one month after a sporting controversy to still try and condition the fans' validation to what took place. That is what they did. That's going to be part seven, breaking down that Sky Sports analysis and also everything else that took place between the seventh, sorry, the Thursday um, of the the, the the day in which the Mercedes effectively withdrew their appeal, did a deal with the FIA. Because again, this the deal that Mercedes did, that has taken many of us uh, a lot of coming to terms with. We perceived Mercedes to be the victims in this. Now, were Mercedes told, don't worry, don't expose us and we will, we will get this right? Were, were they promised that and then the FIA did the dirty on them? Or did, were Mercedes in on just accepting it anyway because they knew that the drama created, the show created, the fakeness created would ultimately enhance the sport in terms of the viewership that they would then benefit from as well. So they just accepted the corruption because they were going to financially benefit from the corruption. Well, you didn't fight hard enough, Mercedes. So because of that, that demonstrates that you are actually complicit with the corruption. Definitely, on some level, you are complicit. And then part eight of this now is going to be the FIA review, um, because that report that they produced where they told the world, oh, OK, we've now done a review into this and we're going to now explain to you the findings of our review. Most people will not have gone through that. They will not have analysed the true nature of what that report is. And it is utterly ridiculous. So they're the parts that I'm going to continue to go through. There's more elements to this, but that's a, a basic breakdown of what had to take place to condition people to believe in some sort of authenticity to it. None of it is. Remember, these things do not happen organically. They are contrived. You can't achieve them just as one independent party. There are multiple parties involved in this. Remember, Ferrari in third place did not appeal the fact that their driver was held back behind two lap cars, preventing him from challenging for a top two position in that race. In any other Grand Prix ever, had that have happened, Ferrari would have appealed. Why did they not appeal in Abu Dhabi that the FIA had broken its rules. McLaren. Lando Norris was held back from not being allowed to challenge Pierre Gasly for sixth position in that race due to what the FIA did. Why did McLaren not challenge the FIA, not protest the FIA for that decision? They didn't do it. They were complicit. You can say the same about Alpine because Ocon and Alonso were one of those five cars that were released but not given the full lap to make it around that pack so that they were on the back of that safety car snake to resume racing. Why they didn't protest is because actually those people, they didn't change positions. 
But the resumption of that race was wrong. That should never have happened. They stayed silent about it. They never exposed the implications of this. Also, one of those five cars was Charles Leclerc's uh, Ferrari. Again, Ferrari should have complained about what, what it impacted Carlos Sainz. Sebastian Vettel in the Aston Martin. Aston Martin did nothing about it. You only need to go through the radio messages exchanged between the teams and the drivers before Massey's so-called error that you realise that these teams were willing to accept the rule break before the rules were broken. They were complicit. You've got F1 TV, which is one organisation, showing you a narrative. You've got Sky Sports F1, which is another organisation, lying about the rules of the sport to condition fans to believe the narrative. You've got the FIA in the form of their 10 people or plus in race control. Their four stewards who upheld the, the rule break. You've got the 10 teams all complicit with breaking the rules of the sport to facilitate a last lap shootout spectacle. Something you are not allowed to do. You're not allowed to break the rules of the sport to contrive an ending. That is result manipulation, match fixing. That is fraud. All 10 teams are party to that with their complicity of accepting the rule break. You, you, you can just analyse the messages between the teams and the drivers during that safety car period. Yeah, we think he might restart it like this. We think the safety car might be coming in at the end of this lap. Why might you be thinking that? What discussions have you had ahead of this taking place? What are your so-called agreements? Oh, yes, both teams in the World Cup final. They agreed that it would be ideal if it went down to a penalty shootout. Well, what are you doing there? You're contriving the result of a match or you're contriving an outcome. You're being fraudulent. That's not authentic sport. You're going to get punished. This is how it's going to be. Anyway, until the next time. Have I missed anybody out who's part of this? Well, there'll be more. There'll be more. All to come. See you soon.